The first scripture reading this morning comes from Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. You'll find that on page 198 of your New Testament pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Our second scripture is very familiar. It is Matthew chapter 5. We're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 16. You can find this on page 4 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles if you would like to follow along. Hear the word of the Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Words matter. That's been our focus these past few weeks as we've looked at the power of words. We've learned that there are no neutral words. Everything we say either helps or hurts, it's a bullet or a seed. We've learned that words never really go away and that we are all ultimately accountable for the things that we say. We've discussed the pitfalls of social media, and last week we talked about toxic words, with the big takeaway being words reflect the person speaking them, so be careful what you say about someone else. One thing I did not mention last week is that there have actually been studies that confirm this. So it is scientifically proven that if you trash talk someone, no matter how much you feel they may deserve it, you will be the one who ends up looking trashy. And the upside is, there's no need to take to heart the thoughtless comments of others, since they are never really about us anyway. Today we look at the power of magic words when we're little, and our parents are trying to teach us good manners. We ask for something and they say, what's the magic word? And we say, please. And lo and behold, 
we get our glass of milk or the crayons or a trip to the park or whatever it was we had wanted. So we learn at a very young age that our words can have a positive effect on people. You know, I recently read that the Harry Potter books have sold more than 400 million copies since they first appeared more than 20 years ago. 400 million copies, and they have been translated into 68 different languages. Those are biblical proportions. And I think one of the reasons they continue to be so popular is our fascination with and longing for magical powers. The ability to make exceptional things happen. The way these young wizards and witches can wave their wands and say the right words, and with the flick of their wrist, books go back on the shelf all by themselves. Light appears in the darkness. Things that were invisible become visible. We picture ourselves in that world and visualize how wonderful it would be to speak the right words and have things happen. I saw a cartoon on Facebook a couple weeks ago. Perhaps you've seen it too. It, it may be one of those that's been around for a while, and it's an example of the positive power of social media. And it shows a man walking along in a tall hat. His head is bowed. There's kind of a sad, gloomy look on his face. And there's another man off to the side, standing with a child. And the man says to the child, watch. The man calls out to the man in the hat, hey, your hat is awesome, and you are awesome for wearing it. The man in the hat replies, oh, um, thank you. The man with the child says to the child, now, look at his face. Sure enough, the man in the hat is walking off with this huge smile on his face. The man with the child says to the child, we all have our powers. And the child says, cool. Even as plain, ordinary children of God, our words have power. And nowhere do they have more power than when we use them to build people up and inspire and affirm them. Now, you have heard sermons on the Beatitudes before, and you will hear them again. But I was drawn to this passage this week because this is such a great example of Jesus building people up with his words. Here are these disciples with this big crowd gathered around, most of them living hand-to-mouth, paycheck-to-paycheck. Infant mortality was high, life expectancy was low, everybody had lost a child themselves or knew someone who did. <clears throat> Their land was occupied by a foreign power. And the people listening to Jesus that day had little money, little power, little or no, none of the worldly success that we strive for today. And Jesus looks at this gathering of nobodies, this group of people at the bottom, and says, Blessed are you. The Greek word here is makarios. We're used to hearing it translated as blessed or happy or fortunate. Another way to hear this word is honored. Honor was the highest value in ancient Mediterranean society, more important even than money. Jesus speaks to a people at the bottom and says, you are honored. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so eventually this little group of disciples, having learned to see themselves the way Jesus sees them, will go out and change the world as they spread the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Now, we're each responsible 
for our own sense of self-worth. It is not anybody else's job to make us feel good about ourselves by giving us a steady, nonstop stream of compliments and attaboys or attagirls. Self-esteem needs to come from the sure and certain knowledge that we are children of God, beloved just as we are, warts and all. And yet, words of affirmation are extremely powerful. In fact, they can be magical. And here's an example. Years ago, when I was doing youth ministry in Lee Summit, Missouri, there was some negativity going on in my youth group. The youth were putting each other down and criticizing each other a lot. They were complaining. They'd started forming little cliques, which is not what church is all about. So one day I called all the adult leaders together, and I gave them each a little mesh bag, and inside that mesh bag was a stack of 3 by 5 index cards and some Sharpies, because teenagers, for whatever reason, seem to love Sharpies. And we began to use something we call compliment cards. So every time we heard a youth putting down another person, even if they were just kidding, which is how they liked to, I was just kidding, we would whip out a blank index card and hand it to the youth along with a Sharpie. And they had to write three compliments about the person they had just put down. And we had a rule that only one of the three compliments could be related to outward appearance. Like, they couldn't just say, nice shoes, nice shirt, nice hair, mm-mm. Each compliment card had to be approved by an adult, read out loud in front of everybody, and then handed to the person receiving it. Any guesses as to what happened next? They loved it. They loved it. They got into it. First, they became hypervigilant about policing each other for put-downs because they were really eager to catch someone putting somebody else down so they could watch them have to go do the whole compliment card thing. That was number one. Second, they got really, really good at compliments because I would never let them use the same thing twice about the same person. And third, they discovered they loved giving and receiving compliments. It really was almost magical. It got to the point where one day on a road trip, I, I heard a youth say to another youth, hey, say something mean to me so you'll have to give me a compliment card. They loved hearing all the good things that the other youth saw in them, and so it wasn't long before we didn't need compliment cards at all. And we kind of gradually forgot about them and just started building in lots and lots of affirmation activities into our events instead. I wonder what would happen if families and elected leaders and the media all had to use compliment cards for a year. Even introverts who typically stay out of the spotlight generally appreciate a good compliment. But magic words go beyond compliments. I often use the book The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman when I'm doing premarital counseling. It is a great book about showing love effectively in a way your partner can actually understand you. And he explains that words of affirmation include not only compliments, but words of encouragement. When we see potential in someone and believe in someone and we let them know it. It also includes kind words, such as words of forgiveness and acceptance. And receiving someone's anger without striking back. It includes humble words, which is when we ask people nicely to do things for us instead of demanding them. And he also explains the bonus you get when you indirectly affirm someone. For example, when you praise your wife to her mother, your wife 
will hear that you said something nice about her and you get double credit. When we practice honest and thoughtful affirmation on a regular basis, it works magic in our lives and in our relationships. Even if we're affirming someone whose primary love language is not words, it reinforces for us the good things in the other person. And that is good for us as well as them, and it makes us look good too. You may have picked up some potential contradictions between last week's and today's messages. Because on the one hand, I stressed we're not supposed to take the words of others personally, especially the negative ones. But on the other hand, positive words really do have the power to build people up. And I think that happens when a well-chosen word from someone else meets what we already know to be true about ourselves deep down inside, but we just haven't unearthed it yet, or we've forgotten about it, or we've doubted it. We forget that we're blessed, and we are honored, and we are salt and light. Well, guess what our challenge is this week? That's right. We've done this before, but it's been about a year, and it's time to do it again. Use your words this week to build up a different person every day. Do it through a thank you note, a phone call, a post on social media, a face-to-face -face conversation, whatever works for you. And when you do, do not be surprised if it magically feels as if you are being built up too. Amen. Amen.